Um, okay, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning if you are on the other side of the ocean, or good uh, evening if you are uh, to the uh, west of us. Um, so this is uh, um, the uh, new talk in the series of Machine Learning for Science, and uh, it is my uh, big pleasure to introduce you to the speaker for today, who is uh, Alexander Tachenko from the University of Luxembourg. Um, the many of you uh, may know for his uh, 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 contribution to, in particular, to the development of uh, Van der Waals uh, interaction with the density functional theory, and uh, also more uh, recently to developing various uh, machine learning uh, technique uh, still applied to material science. So um, without any further ado, I just give you uh, the stage, uh, please, Alex. Um, thank you very much, Stefano, for organizing this. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening to this uh, new seminar for us, a new way of presenting seminars. So what I would like to do today is to uh, explain some recent developments in the domain of machine learning and its applications in particular to understand quantum properties of molecules within potentially large chemical spaces that include uh, compositional and configurational degrees of freedom of molecules in the in broadest sense. But uh, I would not only like to demonstrate how typical uh, machine learning applications are done uh, in terms of uh, producing accurate and predictive models for molecular data, but also one of the main points of my talk will be how to do how to get new insights by applying machine learning to uh, quantum chemical spaces. Now, of course, uh, all of you are probably familiar with machine learning. It's, of course, the topic of the day, and the machine learning is used everywhere, in your search engine, on your phone, in some fancier new cars, and even in some uh, new washing machines. Uh, and of course, uh, since uh, it's an interesting field, and there have been a lot of very interesting developments in the field of machine learning, it has also found many applications in the sciences. And that's, of course, the main uh, topic of this seminar, machine learning for sciences. So the question is how we could use machine learning, which typically is considered to be an inductive technique, to something that is deductive, such as physics. Uh, and of course, if we can solve physical equations, we can often also address a lot of chemical and biological as well. So the way that typically um, research is um, progresses in natural sciences is of course starting with fundamental laws of nature such as uh, the Schrodinger equation and then making active approximations to solve the Schrodinger equation. So you'll know that we cannot solve the Schrodinger equation for a large molecular material. Hence, we come up with well-defined approximations, for example, density functional theory, perturbation theory, couple cluster methods, and so on and so forth. Then we make an approximation to the famous Schrodinger equation. And by using the solution of the Schrodinger equation, along with other statistical techniques, so using uh, first principles of statistical mechanics as well enables us to develop and design new molecules and materials. Now, uh, of course, uh, what we also have been becoming better and better in the field of physics and chemistry is actually producing reliable data. And producing reliable data has become easier with the evolution of uh, high performance computing. And hence, there is really an abundance of reliable data throughout chemi chemistry and physics. And this in particular holds in the domain of molecules. So we can take essentially limitless amounts of molecules, we can create their structures on our computer and compute their quantum mechanical properties, so observables based on, on their wave function. Now, of course, the data itself gives us the ability then to ask new questions, because if you go beyond small data to big data, then we can, in principle, start to dream. And our wildest dream in the end is to discover the structure of chemical space. And so, of course, this has a counterpart in how uh, in general, human development progresses by uh, drawing maps 
and by developing some guiding principles. For example, uh, drawing constellations in space. In principle, we all, you know, uh, I used to look at the stars and draw constellations, but in practice, actually, it's pretty useless because oftentimes this is just used to draw some mental picture or to give some order to the stars. But we think that actually when we do the same process in chemical space, perhaps actually drawing such molecular constellation, quote unquote, is actually helpful in order to understand structure, topology and geometry of uh, chemical spaces and hence actually be able to do better uh, design in those chemical spaces. So design new molecules and materials is very specific properties. And recently we've actually wrote a paper that uh, gives a perspective on what, uh, how to achieve this wildest dream. Eventually, it has not been yet achieved. And we think that machine learning is a key technology that will help us to achieve that goal in principle faster. So let me now uh, briefly compare uh, what is done in machine learning versus what is done in physics. So in machine learning, a typical problem involves image recognition. So you are given an image, which in this case, it's an image of a ladybug, and you have a very sophisticated nonlinear regressor. In this case, this is a neural network. And as you progress from the image, from the pixels of the image to the output, well, you want to classify those images, for example. And if you see a ladybug and your neural networks at the output tells you that this is a ladybug, well, it's a good prediction. If it tells you that this is a cat, then it's a bad prediction. Now, current machine learning methods, uh, which have become quite sophisticated, so-called deep neural networks, are typically very good at this task of image recognition. But of course, um, um, you know, if uh, some images are misclassified, this is not a big catastrophe. Now, in physics uh, uh, and chemistry, uh, we have a bit different requirements on what we want our algorithms to achieve, right? So when we solve the Schrodinger equation, uh, what we want our method to have, because we cannot solve the Schrodinger equation exactly, and we take approximations, we want our approximations, of course, to be accurate compared to the exact solution of the Schrodinger equation. We want them to be predictive in a sense that as we move from systems we know to systems we don't know, we still want to have predictive power in our approximate uh, methods for solving the Schrodinger equation. But of course, we want to solve the Schrodinger equation for larger and larger systems. Hence, our methods have to be efficient. And we not only want our methods to be efficient and accurate, but we also want our methods to give us insight. So one example is um, um, uh, orbital expansions and density functional theory. And you can look at those orbitals beyond just computing energies and uh, some other properties. But actually, you can get insights into how chemical reactions proceed by looking at the orbitals or the electron density. And this is what means getting insight, right? So in principle, if we had the exact solution of a Schrodinger equation with a many body wave function, this would not give us insight, right? Because the many body wave function is just a very high dimensional object that we cannot get much insight from. So hence, uh, now the question is how we combine these two different domains, machine learning uh, that uh, wants to, you know, give us regression problems or classification problems, and how we uh, use machine learning uh, for, uh, um, you know, learning solutions of a Schrodinger equation that still are accurate, efficient, and that gives us insight. Now, it turns out that combining machine learning and physics uh, is actually um, uh, quite beneficial for both machine learning and physics at the same time. Uh, because uh, basically um, uh, applying machine learning to, to physical and chemical data always involves this problem of balancing between descriptor or representation of your data, which encodes all the prior knowledge of the problem that you have, and the data itself. And physics is deductive, machine learning is inductive, so in principle this also provides a feedback between two completely different approaches. Uh, another thing why physics and machine learning or their combination makes sense is because physicists are, are very good typically at postulating laws. And uh, as the data grows, well, we need help from machine learning to actually postulate uh, high order laws. Um, physics also challenges machine learning. Um, 
in when we solve um, certain equations with approximations, we typically have no noise, at least no statistical noise. We can produce data of arbitrary high dimensionality. We can produce scalars, vectors, tensors, and so on. And we can choose data points at will. In a sense, if we want to produce a new data set and we have a certain computational power, then we can select our samples at will. Um, there is also, of course, abundance of data, uh, both from experiments and calculations uh, in terms of physical systems. And of course, uh, one thing which is very important is that the behavior of many systems we work with is actually nonlinear. And so this is perfect for machine learning applications. And as never before, looking at this, of course, the famous quote from Eugene Wigner actually becomes even more relevant as we use more and more of machine learning techniques and apply them to physical and chemical data. Okay, so before I proceed to uh, connect machine learning and uh, physics, I would like to um, spend a few words on how we uh, do research today in the domain of quantum physics slash chemistry. So typically, uh, and, and this all will be based, of course, on solving Schrodinger equation for energy or for other uh, quantum mechanical uh, properties that you might be interested in. So let's say we are given a molecule, in this case, you know, a very simple molecule that consists of two carbon atoms, which are the black uh, spheres, hydrogen atoms, which are the white spheres, and oxygen atoms, which are the red spheres. And um, uh, once we have the structure of that molecule and we know the, um, uh, the nuclear charges of the atoms, right? In this case, uh, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, then we can write the Hamiltonian for the molecule, which is in principle just a classical Hamiltonian that includes interactions, uh, you know, it includes the kinetic energy term and the potential energy terms uh, for the Coulomb interactions between nuclei and electrons. And then uh, all we have to do, right, uh, is to solve the Schrodinger equation. Uh, now, if you have many elections, uh, then we are not able to solve the Schrodinger equation exactly because it involves computing the wave function, which is a three n-dimensional object where n is the number of electrons, and hence we have to proceed by approximations. So we put a tilde on the wave function, and tilde means it's an approximate wave function. So we have some approximate representation, such as provided by DFT, dense functional theory, perturbation theory, or cluster methods, and so on. And once we do that, and we now can solve the Schrodinger equation with certain approximations, then we can compute molecular properties. So we can compute energy, the total energy of the molecule, its polarizability, its electronic levels, and so on and so forth. We might also be interested in the dynamics of the molecule, hence we can compute the forces that act on atoms as a function of the conformational degrees of freedom of the molecule. So we change the nuclear positions, and then we can compute thermal properties, spectroscopic properties, and so on and so forth. Now, one thing that, of course, so this has been, this kind of calculations have been done already for decades in the field of quantum chemistry and quantum physics, electronic structure theory, but um, typically Typically, you do such calculation for one molecule, such as the one shown here, and you then do this for the other molecule, molecule B, molecule C, molecule D, molecule E, and then you never actually uh, cross-correlate between molecules. But of course, as we progress and we generate more data for more molecules, in principle, we can then take that data uh, as, as a whole, and, and then we can start asking very different questions. And that's where the idea of machine learning really comes into uh, molecular processes. So instead of doing what I just said, studying molecule by molecule, we actually create a training set, which includes molecular properties for many molecules. And then we use machine learning, um, um, which, you know, in, in the first approximation is a black box, and I will show how to open this black box later in my talk. But once we have an analytical representation of how molecular properties change in a chemical space as a function of nuclear charges and positions, we could, in principle, ask very different questions about, about molecules. We can ask questions about the structure of chemical space, right? What are, what are the nonlinear behaviors of properties throughout chemical space? We can ask questions of reactivity trends, how properties correlate with other properties, uh, or we can even probably ask questions about new chemistry if we go outside of the domain of simple molecules. And finally, if we close the cycle and invert the loop, then in principle, we can actually uh, pose an inverse design question, right? So we have a, a set of properties and we want to find all molecules that satisfy that set of properties, right? And that's really the 
uh, a long-term outlook into combining machine learning and uh, um, quantum chemical data. Okay, so then we come to this question of what is chemical space? And uh, for that, we need to uh, define some chemical space uh, depending on what is your uh, property of interest or what is your uh, goal, like is it designing a new drug, is it designing a new thermoelectric material, and so on and so forth. And depending on whether you work in material space and chemical space, depending on the flexibility of your systems, you might have different ideas of how chemical space should be defined. But in principle, we know first principles of quantum mechanics, and we all know that uh, the only information that we need in order to obtain all properties of a molecule is just the positions of its atoms and the charges of the nuclei. And that's it. From this information, we can make a map to a vector of properties. And so these properties might be, as I said before, it can be total energy, polarizability, dipole moment, quadrupole moment, right? Homo lumo uh, levels, you know, band cap, and so on and so forth. And so uh, each material in principle, as we add more and more properties, each uh, the mapping between the nuclear charges and positions and the property vector becomes unique, eventually. Um, now, of course, uh, the, the, in many of the chemical uh, design questions, we, also, we are actually interested only in a finite amount of properties, and hence the inverse mapping between the property vector and nuclear charges and positions might not be uniquely defined, which is still you know, a relevant uh, design question because you might be given three or four properties and their intervals or values, and you would like to find all possible molecules that actually produce that particular set of properties, right? So you might not be interested in a bijective transformation between properties and positions and charges, but actually it, it can be, it can just go, you know, in, in one direction. Um, now, of course, immediately uh, when, uh, when we want to do machine learning on molecular big data, so to apply machine learning in a certain chemical space, we have to think how do we practically uh, ask that question. How do we practically develop a machine learning model? And the first thing that uh, we need is a, a descriptor or a representation, which are you know two uh, two equivalent things. Uh, so, what is a good representation of a molecule? And it turns out that for machine learning, just the positions and charges are actually a very bad descriptor because they don't include all the uh, external degrees of freedom, all the symmetries of space and time, basically, uh, or all the local symmetries of molecules as well. And for example, um, the rotation and translational symmetry is not included if we use nuclear um, um, charges and positions as a descriptor. We need to use distances between atoms, and, and that would give you rotational and translational invariance for free. Uh, but then there are other symmetries, there are permutational symmetries, right? If you exchange two carbon atoms in a molecule, its properties should not change. So those properties are a bit trickier to include. And, and so immediately this question of descriptor or representation is actually already a non-trivial question. Then once you've uh, represented a molecule as a certain vector or matrix or tensor, uh, then the question is how do you define a metric in that space? So how do you define a similarity measure between two molecules? Then, if you, are, if you have the freedom to select your data, uh, what, what molecules do you generate for training? There is billions and billions of molecules, and uh, uh, how do we select from a given chemical space, right? Even if you restrict our chemical space, we might still have 10 to the 60 molecules. Um, and finally, how do we represent the properties of molecules? So which properties uh, do we include in order to achieve um, a unique solution if you're interested in such a unique solution. So all of these questions come in mind um, uh, and are important if we want to obtain insights into uh, the chemical compound space of our interest. So um, even before, you know, the first step when we do machine learning is, of course, to look at the data at hand. And uh, uh, we've done that in 2013 by, uh, or in 2012 actually, by computing a small 
data set of uh, molecules, so-called QM7 data set, which has 7,200 molecules or so, and we've computed their quantum chemical properties, a range of them. For example, the total energy, the uh, homolumo levels, uh, so the electronic levels, the polarizability, the dipole moment, the heat capacity, and so on. And uh, the first thing you can do, and, and you get surprising results, is you just plot pairwise property correlation. So, for example, how the polarizability of a molecule depends on its homolumo gap. So basically, the gap between the highest occupied orbit and the lowest unoccupied orbit. And from textbook knowledge and from a simple sort of conceptual analysis, you think that these two properties, polarizability and the homolumo gap, must be correlated. Maybe not perfectly linearly, but there should be a weak nonlinear correlation. And that's because in the polarizability formula, the first denominator is the homolumo gap, right? So that should be, in the best situation, the highest contributing term to the polarizability. And hence, if you have something in the denominator, as it decreases, right, the polarizability increases and vice versa. But if you look at the plot uh, of these blue dots, um, you realize that there's absolutely no correlation when you look at large enough chemical spaces. So I could, of course, take that blob and I could select, for example, all alkanes in that blob. So I add CH3 groups to my molecule, it's a linear alkane, and then, in fact, I would see a linear correlation between polarizability and homolumo gap. But when I go out of that simple, uh, you know, homologous series of molecules, I realize that I can get a molecule with essentially arbitrary polarizability and arbitrary homolumo gap at the same time, which is actually quite a big surprise because textbooks tell us that this should not be the case. And then you look at all the other correlations. So the correlation between lumo level, homo level, heat capacity and homo lumo cap, or energy and polarizability. There are also some textbook, standard textbook correlations, but you see here that those correlations don't really hold at all. So this means that, uh, that we have a huge diversity in chemical space. And in fact, this gives us a certain thing that I like to call freedom of design, because if we define a set of properties that the molecule should satisfy, we can probably always find a molecule that satisfies those properties independently of what are the values of the properties that we've selected. Now, there are some limits, of course, um, uh, within the chemical space, but, 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 but those limits are not very restricted. And so this is something I, I really like because it illustrates that even before we do any machine learning on molecular data, we already get insights from just very simple data analysis. But of course, we actually computed that data right throughout chemical space to do machine learning in the first place. So we wouldn't probably do that analysis if we, if we were not thinking to apply machine learning to this data. Right. So this just illustrates how the questions that you ask in your research might change once you include machine learning in your um, you know, set of techniques. Okay, so now let's come to uh, applying machine learning to the data. And uh, uh, the slide I took from uh, uh, a long-term collaborator of mine, Klaus Müller, who is a of course, professor for machine learning in uh, TU Berlin. Um, uh, and uh, at the moment already working in, on a sabbatical in Google Brain. And so um, the basic machine learning uh, goal is, for example, to classify data. And so if we are given points, uh, blue points and red points in this case, then we might ask a question of what is a good classifier? What is a good class of functions that actually distinguishes blue from red? And uh, of course, we can draw uh, a hyperplane, or in this case, it's a two-dimensional data. So we just uh, draw a line, right, the black line. And this line, you know, seemingly uh, works to separate the blue and the red. But you might also then add a much more complex curve, the gray curve that I show here. And then uh, if you are given these two functions, we might ask a question of to which class of, of points does the black point belong? And of course, with the line, the black point would definitely belong to the class of red points. But with a more complex function, it might actually we might be undecided where this black point would be, right? 
So, so the typical scenario in machine learning is you, you learn from data, you generalize from data, and so you're given data set, um, which in the case of molecules would be molecular configurations, right? So the positions and, and, and charges of, of atoms. And we are given a set of labels. So in the case of molecules, this can be the energy of each molecule or its polarizability or some other property. And of course, uh, uh, the mapping between labels, uh, between uh, uh, data set X, right? And, and the labels is given by some uh, joint probability distribution, which we don't know, right? So we, what we want to do is to learn uh, this mapping function Y, right? That uh, applies uh, uh, basically some function to, to the X, to the data set. Um, and so examples of this can be uh, fitting chemical compound space. Uh, this is uh, one modification I did to Klaus's slide, uh, which said understand chemical compound space, but of course understanding requires more than just machine learning. So at the moment, if you just apply machine learning, you're basically fitting chemical compound space. Or you can distinguish brain states. In fact, a lot of the um, widely used techniques in machine learning come from neuroscience. Uh, but of course, the main question in machine learning is how to do this fitting, uh, this good performance on unseen data. So how we can generalize, not just fit, but general. And there are two most popular techniques which are widely used in machine learning. One is kernel methods, nonlinear kernel methods typically, and deep neural networks, uh, which have become uh, quite popular recently. Uh, and so kernel uh, methods are pretty easy to explain. This is a slide from Matthias Rupp, who is also uh, the, uh, one of the, uh, the, the first order of the first machine learning paper that we co-wrote together with uh, Klaus Müller and uh, Anatol von Lilienfeld. And so the kernel learning idea is pretty simple. So again, they are given points and they are given two classes of points. There are blue points and orange points. And in this case, they, have, they live in one dimension. Right? So we have this, uh, uh, this, this, this point on the line. And so this is our input space. Now, if you want to define a function which separates uh, blue from orange, we cannot easily do this in one dimensional space. But what we can do is we can transform this input space, this linear input space, to a so-called feature space, to a nonlinear space. And we can do this transformation with a sine function. And if we use the sine function, then suddenly the line, right, the x-axis, separates the blue points from the orange points immediately. And so we get a perfect classifier in this case by just going from a linear space to a higher dimensional, in this case, two-dimensional uh, nonlinear space. Okay? Um, and so what you do in practice, of course, in for any data is you're given some, some data set. And what you do is so-called kernel rich regression. So you write a function which includes linear coefficients alpha, which are your unknowns, and a certain nonlinear kernel that compares, that gives you a similarity measure between your training points and a point that you want to predict. And uh, it turns out that this problem, if you formulate a loss function, right, the coefficients, the linear coefficients alpha, are obtained by solving a simple uh, um, um, a simple equation, which essentially just uh, uh, requires a solution of the simple linear inversion problem with your kernel matrix and the identity matrix. And the lambda here is so-called hyperparameter that basically regularizes the problem, makes it uh, makes the inverse uh, uh, well posed. Okay. Uh, a completely different set of methods is uh, neural networks and. Uh, Typically, neural networks were invented because kernel methods do not tend to scale, although there are, there are scalable kernel implementations. So they don't typically scale with the number of training points, right? Once you go beyond, say, 10,000 or 100,000 points, uh, you typically prefer to use um, architectures, machine learning architectures, where the size of the architecture is fixed. And this is uh, uh, pretty well done by deep neural networks, where you have some input layer, you propagate uh, uh, through the nonlinear activation functions, which can be you know, hyperbolic tangent, sigmoidal function, or rectification functions. And then at the end, you have a linear layer that just sums the whole thing and, and gives you your output which can be, of course, uh, scalar output, vector output, tensor output, whatever you want. And when you uh, make the network deeper, in principle, you increase its predictive capacity, its uh, 
class of uh, uh, nonlinear functions it can predict. And uh, because the architecture of the network is predefined, you have to define it as a creator of the network. Then uh, basically, you know how much you have to pay in terms of computer time to train it or to obtain predictions from the neural network. And in principle, uh, uh, deep neural networks today can be applied to millions or even probably billions of, of, of data points. Okay, so now um, uh, I gave this brief introduction into two classes of methods in machine learning, kernel methods and neural networks. And I would like to apply now those methods to the data that I've just shown a few slides ago on the um, uh, QM7 and QM9 data sets. So the data that I will be using for the rest of my talk, uh, a lot of it comes initially from the so-called GGB data set uh, by Jean-Louis Raymond from University of Bern who have uh, devised an algorithm to generate, uh, basically with graph theory, uh, molecular configurations or smile strings of molecules, which defines the connectivity, chemical connectivity between atoms. And then uh, we have generated conformations or configurations of those molecules and have actually computed their quantum mechanical properties. The QM7 data set was initially obtained by myself and another from Lilienfeld in 2012 and the QM9 data set, which includes 130,000 molecules roughly, have been produced in Anatolis von Lilienfeld's group. Another set of uh, data I will use are molecular dynamics trajectories of small molecules, which is the MD17 data set, which is produced in TU Berlin. And uh, all this data is available on the website uh, quantummachine.org if you're interested to play around with the data by yourself. Okay, so uh, the first important question when you apply machine learning to data is any data, in, in fact, uh, you want to have a baseline. So you want to know whether your prediction is good or bad. And when you don't know anything about the data in the machine learning domain, there are, uh, you know, well established ways to uh, define a baseline, such as a mean predictor. So you just sum of uh, labels of all your data set, um, or you define some K means predictor. But in, uh, in the domain of physics and chemistry, we often have already uh, approximate models, which don't cost too much computational time. And so we can actually devise physical baselines. And for molecular property prediction, this turns out to be crucial because it turns out that if you compare the first results of machine learning when they were generated for the data sets I mentioned, QM7, uh, then you immediately realize that the baseline, a very simple physical baseline you might devise, actually gives you better prediction than the first machine learning predictions that were available in 2012, 2013. And hence, it's very important to actually define the baselines. And we've done this in this paper in 2015 by essentially um, developing uh, a well-defined hierarchy of uh, uh, predictors from just sum over atoms to sum over bonds to two-body potentials and then to sophisticated machine learning methods to see whether the complexity of the model necessarily implies increase of accuracy of the prediction. And to summarize the results, here comes the data from our recent paper in 2018, where basically what we do is we look at how the predictions have uh, of machine learning models to this QM9 data set, which includes 130,000 molecules, uh, have improved over time. So what I'm showing here is uh, the performance of these so-called learning curves or training curves, uh, the performance of different machine learning models as a function of number of training samples. And I'm showing you the mean absolute error in kcal per mole of the atomization energy of those models. And so, of course, what you would like to achieve is a one kcal per mole, which is considered chemical accuracy, which is useful for thermodynamic predictions. And, um, and then uh, let's see what uh, the performance of the different models are. And so uh, we start with a model which we developed in 2011. This is the so-called SCM or sorted Coulomb matrix model. And as you see, it starts off at very, very badly at about 30 something kcal per mole for 500 molecules in a training set. And then as you put more and more molecules in the training set and you predict all the rest of the database as, as a test set, 
then the performance improves drastically and, and, and pretty non-linear. Right? Um, uh, now, of course, you can then put more physics into the descriptor. So for example, the bag of bonds model puts information about the, so it basically provides a better similarity measure. It puts the same information to the descriptor, but it provides a better similarity measure than the Coulomb matrix. So it puts a bit more physics in the descriptor. And you see that in 2015, the, the green curve is significantly better. But nothing changed from, from, the, the, from this blue curve to the green curve, right? We only put a bit more information in the descriptor. The data is still the same. Now, um, in 2018, we've came up with many body descriptors, uh, this F2B plus F3B descriptor, the, main, the explicit many body representation descriptor that uh, you can see starts off really with 500 molecules, you already have a performance of about 3 kcal per mole on the, data, on the whole data set. And then as you go up, you go essentially to a kcal per mole of chemical accuracy. Uh, and this just illustrates how important is the physics itself in the representations of molecules. So the, the, the machine learning algorithm doesn't change, it's always current reach regression, but the representation uh, really helps you to, uh, um, to change the learning curve uh, inequalities. Of that. Now, of course, uh, you can now take the best model, in this case, the many body representation model, uh, which includes two body and three body interactions between molecules, between atoms and a molecule, and you can apply it to an extensive set of molecular properties. So including uh, extensive molecular properties, atomization energies, uh, polarizabilities, uh, and also intensive ones. So electronic properties such as homolumo gap uh, or the dipole moment. And then you realize that there is uh, quite a qualitative difference in the prediction. So all the properties are predicted pretty fine in the sense of the uh, correlation uh, between, between the reference data computed with density functional theory and uh, the machine learning prediction. But you clearly realize that there are some plots which are straight and, and, and there's absolutely no scatter um, um, above the diagonal. But if you actually look at other plots, there is a lot of scatter. And, and, and the scatter is there uh, only for intensive properties. So basically for electronic properties that do not scale with the molecular size. And it's pretty tough to predict those properties. And this is really the first challenge I want to mention in my talk, that it seems that predicting electronic properties with current representations of molecules is still uh, an unsolved problem. Okay, and so a lot more work is, is required to understand how to better predict intensive properties and still not lose the good accuracy that we have for the extensive properties such as energy. Now, of course, um, um, you know, this question of representation is, uh, is a bit of a black magic because there is actually, there will be never uh, a unified representation that works for everything because you actually want to have different representations that um, basically navigate between the complexity of the representation and its efficiency and how accurate it can potentially be for predicting molecular properties. For uh, applications where you want to go through chemical space and explore it, you want to have the simplest possible representation that is as efficient as possible. But if you want to get very accurate results, then you want a very sophisticated representation and you might not care so much about the computational speed of, of actually computing that representation. And, and for this reason, there's really the, the, the um, topic of, of coming up with new representations is something that is still uh, quite booming at the time. And, and people started thinking of molecular representations quite a long time ago, um, um, but the first few uh, real examples of, of sophisticated representations come from uh, Jörg Bela in 2007, uh, the sole representation of, of Gabor Chani, uh, the Coulomb matrix that represented in, in 2012, the bag of bonds, the sign matrix, you know, partial uh, distribution, uh, radial distribution function. There is really a, a whole zoo of those uh, descriptors or representations that are available today, and, and, and the list still only keeps growing. So for this reason, actually, uh, in 2016, um, we've uh, teamed up with Christoph, uh, who was uh, uh, a visitor at the Institute for Pure and Applied Math, where we had a, a program on combining machine learning with physics. And so uh, basically, we started thinking how to 
um, uh, eliminate this question of designing a manual representation? Could we make a deep neural network actually learn the representation? And uh, Crystal was actually um, uh, quite successful in this. And uh, the final version of this representation, DTNM, is something that uh, I think really was motivated by our discussions on quantum mechanics. And so um, what, uh, what this uh, DTNN architecture does is, so again, it uses the same information as the other descriptors. That's the only available information about the molecule are the positions of the atoms, so the distances between atoms and the uh, charges of those atoms. But then uh, what, uh, what this uh, DTNN architecture does is something uh, pretty clever. So we say that every atom, right, is uh, a certain embedding in a high dimensional space, right? So it's a vector in some high dimensional space. And we, the only thing we need to define is the dimensionality of that space. So say it's 64 dimensions, okay? And so every atom initially is just a, some vector in 64 dimensional space. And depending on the charge of that atom, it would be a different vector. But then, of course, an atom doesn't live by itself, but it interacts with other atoms. And so this interaction can be uh, basically represented in a very general form by a tensor, right? So you have two vectors and they interact and the interaction is just a tensor, right? And so you have to basically learn the, the architecture, this neural network architecture has to learn the components of that tensor. And once you've uh, uh, learned the components of the tensor, then all you do is you just propagate this several times. And at the end of this recursive process, you basically obtain the say, exact uh, embedding of this vector in a high dimensional space for each atom after it has interacted with all the other atoms in the molecule. And so the recursion process basically puts in more and more interactions with far away atoms in a molecule. Uh, and so all this architecture does, there are some, of course, technical details that I'm not going into because we, for example, we use a, a low rank representation of the tensor to, to reduce the number of, of, of uh, parameters in the in the deep networks and so on. But in the end, it all amounts to basically learn those uh, uh, interaction tensor components. Okay, And this is pretty nice because it has really a counterpart in quantum mechanics, right? That's what we do in quantum mechanics when we represent uh, electrons by basis set expansions, right? We say every Every atom has a certain number of basis functions, and these basis functions basically uh, create a certain Hilbert space, restricted Hilbert space. In the same way, I mean, we do exactly the same or, or very similar things in this DTNN architecture. Now, um, the, um, uh, when we apply this DTNN architecture to actual molecular data, we see that it works pretty well for both uh, compositional degrees of freedom, so changing compositions of your molecule or changing the configuration degrees of freedom of your molecule. But, um, um, and, and actually the performance of this model is better than most uh, other kernel-based representations that I've been uh, talking about before. But of course, there is a price to pay here because uh, we, we often need to use much more data to train the deep neural networks than what we need in order to train the kernel methods because there are just simply many more parameters in the deep neural network. So it has the deep neural network has a more expressive power in a sense, right? But it does require a bit more data, not much more, but a bit more data to uh, train uh, an accurate uh, predictor. Um, now, something that is, of course, important is uh, the neural network itself, right, is a black box. And, and so it has, you know, half a million parameters, and it's hard to analyze it. And so the question is, can we actually devise physical principles to analyze what the network has learned? And in fact, we can, and, and we can do the simplest thing, which physicists love to do. They like to probe things with external perturbations. So in this case, what we did is we took, um, so the, the architecture itself, if you look at its uh, DTN architecture, is scalable because you can always add new atoms. So you take a certain DTN architecture for a molecule, say a benzene molecule, you add an additional atom, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, or oxygen, and then you scan over the van der Waals sphere of the molecule, and you plot the energy that that atom gets from the molecule. Right, from the benzene molecule, for example. And then, you know, you, you see that the atom, which you use to probe, actually explores sort of the chemical environment that it feels in the molecule. 
And that chemical environment has chemical sensitivity and it has a configurational uh, sensitivity as well. And so if you look at those plots that I'm showing you here, we call them local chemical potentials in quotes, um, they basically resemble an electrostatic potential or the electron density of the molecule. And hence, this information was never put into the network, right? The network has only seen structures of molecules and the atomization energies, nothing else. And, and yet, the network learns some internal quantum mechanical representation of a molecule, and it allows us to, to look and, and realize, you know, certain electronegative domains of the molecule. And, and so on and so forth. So, so I think this, when I looked at that, it was pretty surprising to me because the network itself has actually learned a lot about the chemistry and about the quantum mechanics of molecules without having that information really explicitly put in. Now, of course, the network also predicts atomic properties and hence we can design new descriptors from the network. We can, for example, compute aromaticity from this DTNN network because we can basically take atomic energies which come out of the network, we can add them up for carbon ring, and we realize that we get a new descriptor of aromaticity based on atomic energies, which is much better than many other available descriptors for aromaticity in the literature. So this gives you, you know, a couple of ideas of how you get insights from deep neural networks beyond their pure predictive power. Now, of course, again, immediately after you do this analysis, you realize that there is a big challenge because uh, the DTNN architecture works extremely well when you have compositional degrees of freedom represented by this QM9 data set, or you just have molecular dynamics degrees of freedom. So the structure of the molecule is changing. You can run a trajectory, for example, of a toluene molecule, and you can perfectly predict it with the uh, DTNN architecture. But when you actually mix those degrees of freedom, so you take a data set of isomer data, so, so isomers with a uh, molecular formula C7O2H10, for example, there are a few thousands of them in this data set. We run molecular dynamics for each of the isomer, we put that data in the network, and the error actually grows with this 1.7 kta per mole. And 1.7 kta per mole is not good enough um, um, error to actually, or not good enough accuracy to run molecular dynamics. So this, you immediately realize that accurately representing both compositional and conformation degrees of freedom is still, you know, a challenge. So this is the second challenge I would like to mention, right? The first one was predicting intensive electronic properties of molecules. So these are two challenges. Um, the, the final thing I would like, I would like to talk about for in the last three minutes or so is um, uh, basically a completely different problem. So if uh, oftentimes you don't want to describe the whole chemical space of certain molecules, but you can approach the problem of describing chemical space from the other side. You take just one molecule and you are interested in uh, an accurate description of the dynamics of this molecule in a certain terminal ensemble. And for this problem, of course, uh, you want to run this molecular dynamics trajectory at the highest possible level of electronic structure theory. So, and the best level we have today is couple cluster theory, right? CCSD parentheses theory. And so in order to do this, it turns out that deep neural networks don't really work because they require too much data. You can never compute millions of points with couple cluster for a large enough molecule. And so for that, we devised a completely different approximation, which we call gradient domain machine learning, which satisfies all these requirements I have on my slide. It's a, it's a global model, so it doesn't break up interatomic interactions. It really acts globally on the molecule. This is a quantum mechanical requirement. It's a data efficient model. It only requires hundreds of data points to learn a global potential energy surface of small molecules. It's an accurate method, it's arbitrary accurate, and it has no energy force artifacts, so you can run very stable molecular dynamics. And, and why we devised this, this uh, new method is because we actually want you to have the ability to have machine learning force fields with couple cluster accuracy, which we can use to carry out quasi integral molecular dynamics simulations of small molecules. And so I will not uh, spend much time on this. I just want to say that in order to achieve all these requirements, uh, we actually needed to do something completely different. We needed to work in the gradient domain, so in the domain of atomic forces, not atomic energies. So we basically explicitly construct a force field with machine learning, or a gradient field, and in this case, a conservative energy conserving gradient field. And this turns out to be a huge advantage in terms of data efficiency and accuracy. And you can read about this in the paper that I mentioned below. 
Now, what we do in practice then with GDML is that we have this gradient domain machine learning, which satisfies the um, property of energy conservation. And we also incorporate all the other local symmetries that molecules might have, for example, permutational symmetries of metal groups and torsional angles, and also uh, global symmetries, point group symmetries of molecules. And then we do that in a, in a basically automated data-driven way. And in the end, we get a kernel method or a kernel force field that can be used to reconstruct potential energy surfaces by just integrating that force curve. Um, it's extremely efficient. It learns from essentially a few hundred configurations. And because we just need a few hundred configurations or conformations of a molecule, we can compute the forces on atoms using couple clusters. And so what is shown on the slide are the applications of gradient domain machine learning, GDML, to pass the integral molecular dynamics of two different molecules. This is one molecule, malon aldehyde. And on the left-hand side, I'm plotting the free energy surface or the probability density uh, for two different aldehyde an angles of this molecule. And I'm comparing the dynamics of the free energy surface generating this couple cluster and DFT. And in this case, you see that the results are pretty similar. And also in the spectra, there is not much difference. But if you go to a much more flexible molecule, aspirin in this case, it has more degrees of freedom. And it's also, you know, has a more complex uh, uh, potential energy surface. And here you realize that couple cluster model, machine learning model, gives you a qualitatively different free energy surface than DFT. So DFT delocalizes the, the, the fluctuations over the whole uh, 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 range of angles, while couple cluster has a localized peak. And if you look at the uh, velocity-velocity autocorrelation function, which gives you approximation for the vibrational spectrum, uh, then the difference between couple cluster and DFT is also pretty high. So in, in, in summary, this really gives us, GDML model gives us the ability to basically carry out essentially exact uh, pass integral microdynamics trajectories for small molecules in the gas phase. Uh, and uh, um, also gives us the ability to go, you know, beyond by making sure that we can handle these small molecules at such accuracy and uh, efficiency. Uh, of course, what we are doing now is we're trying to go beyond uh, GDML models for a single molecule to so-called meta GDML models, where we really expand molecular degree of freedom in chemical space. Um, finally, let me come to uh, the final challenge, which I think is the most complex challenge that we have in, in, in the field of machine learning of complex molecules and materials. And, and, and this really um, basically uh, asks the question of how we can go to complex systems. So I've been talking about throughout all of my talk about simple small molecules. Well, small molecules still actually not, they, they can be pretty difficult, uh, for example, aspirin molecule. But if you want to go to proteins, nanostructures, or water, uh, or molecular crystals, then what we have been doing so far with machine learning is insufficient. We've been basically working on describing local interactions or short range interactions. If you need to go, if you want to go to larger molecules, we need to think of non-covalent interactions. And they are also, of course, quantum mechanical in nature. And hence, we have to use um, um, probably physical models for non-covalent interactions and couple them with machine learning models to really uh, come up with unified techniques that integrate both local degrees of freedom and non-local ones. Finally, the two codes I mentioned, the uh, Schnett uh, pack, which implements DTNN and Schnett architectures and GDML uh, model are available online. So you can feel free to play around with these two different packages. And of course, any feedback would be highly appreciated. With this, I leave you with my final slide of uh, the different grand challenges that I've mentioned already in my talk. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, so as uh, in all this virtual seminar, there is uh, no clapping at the end, but we give you a virtual clapping, I guess. Uh, thanks a lot for, uh, uh, for the talk. And uh, so, as usual, um, I'm asking uh, uh, all the people uh, who are uh, following at the moment to uh, post questions to um, the, um, the YouTube uh, um, chat line. So maybe uh, while we're waiting for people to start to post questions, um, uh, maybe Alex, I'll, 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 have a, I'll, I'll start maybe with a question myself. 
Um, now, I was noticing that when you when you show at the beginning um, all this hierarchy of representation going from um, uh, Coulomb matrix to down to say many body type of representation, when you go to the many body, your your learning curve seems to be very very flat with a number of molecule, right? Um, is is this something intrinsic of the many body representation or um, you have a pretty homogeneous training set there that so you learn very quickly once you have enough if you like uh, uh, many body uh, neighbors yeah so so um, um, so so yeah so so the first thing of course one notices is that the the offset right at the low yes. uh, number of training samples is already pretty good Right? So we're talking about the 3K Calper models, um, which is already a very good uh, performance for, for a model, which means that the many body... So basically, this the model, this particular model, uh, which includes two body and three body terms, uh, so distances and angles in a certain way, um, encodes a lot of the information about local interactions. And this seems to be sufficient for this particular molecules, right? Which are small molecules, right? This is... Uh, molecules up to um, uh, seven heavy atoms. Uh, heavy means carbon, nitrogen, mm. and oxygen. Um, and so the largest molecule has about 30 atoms, right, including hydrogens. Um, in, in this particular molecule, it's predicting uh, it's, uh, the atomization energy to 3 kcal per mole, but it doesn't require a lot of information. Right? So, so the descriptor is sort of getting saturated. And then, um, now, now, of course, the the final you know to go from three to one is pretty difficult task right mm. because we basically start facing this exponential wall right uh so so the main purpose of this plot is saying look i mean in from 2011 to 2018 in seven years we've progressed so much by just changing the physics of the representation um now clearly if you change the data set and we go to much larger molecules right the the offset will again jump up uh, and then we'll probably have to do something much smarter. We have to have multi, you know, multi scale methods for interactions, or we have to put physical models for non covalent interactions on top of the machine learning models. I'm not sure what the best way is actually. Mm. Yeah. Um, let's see if there are some questions. Um, okay, so I don't see questions. So. I'll probably ask another one. Um, so when you describe the DTNN uh, method, um, so so here actually, so the, the, the network that was doing this embedding, what was the target quantity uh, that you, you used for constructing this network? Yeah, the target quantity in this case is the atomization energy. Okay. And I mean, the and, line, which and, is and, the same. And why do you think actually the same one is is work is not working as well with with electronic quantity. Um, it still works fine. So so the if you look, yeah, I don't have the the correlation plots like for this kernel method. But if you look at the correlation plots in uh, uh, Christoph's thesis, he has those correlation plots as well. They look similar. To, I mean, the, the performance is a bit better is the is the deep network. In fact, for some properties, much better. But the overall behavior is similar to what you see on this slide, that the extensive properties are always predicted perfectly, while the intensive ones exhibit some mm. scatter. And, and the reason for that is uh, pretty simple as well, right? If you look at the architecture, at the end of the architecture, so at the end, right below, you have the energy. This is the energy of the molecule. Mm -hmm. And it comes from summing over atomic energies, right? And uh, and the atomic, so so this this architecture itself assumes that you can actually partition properties on atoms. Right. Now, of course, you could, instead of a sum, you could do a product or something else, right? And we've tried that, and in fact, we can get the intensive properties better, but but they are never really as good as the extensive ones yet. So so you need you know sort of more nonlinearity in how you define your prediction problem basically. 
Yes. Um, maybe the, the, the last question for me, and uh, then if there's no question from the audience, I think we, we may close, is, um, so you, 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 you discuss uh, um, uh, molecules, essentially, and can you maybe mention what are the additional challenge, if any, to go to uh, extended solids, essentially? Right, I think there are two parts of this question. So again, I, I for molecules, I've discussed these different kernel architectures and neural network architectures that aim to go in compositional space. And then I've discussed in the end, a model that uh, GDML that is uh, basically aiming at uh, a force field uh, for, for molecules. So, so you can do exactly the same for materials. Um, and so in principle, some of the representations I've mentioned can be used for materials. You just need to include, of course, the cell degrees of freedom. Um, the uh, DTNN architecture have been applied to materials as well. Mm. So there is no problem in actually in, in including periodic boundary conditions in the architecture. Um, and we've done that recently with the Schnett architecture, which is the next version of DTNN. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in principle, the same kind of architecture, the same kind of ideas apply to materials too. Uh, and in fact, what we've recently realized, which is something new and unpublished is that if you talk about, um, the potential energy surfaces for materials, for example, you take graphene and you want to run molecular dynamics of graphene, the symmetries that we, that, that we use for molecules actually become much more, um, uh, useful in the solid state. Right? Because you typically have a lot of atoms of the same type. And, and so there's a lot of permutational symmetries uh, that you can exploit. And, and we've done that in this, in this GDML framework. And actually, we can make models for global potential energy surfaces of materials that use, you know, two, three orders of magnitude less data than what is currently used, for mm. example, for SOAP architecture or for deep neural networks. Yeah. And, and so I think this question of, of how you actually bring in symmetries uh, in uh, the models, uh, they'll become actually even more relevant in materials. And this has not been exploited so much up to now. Okay. Um, okay. We have a, a question from uh, um, James Nelson, who's uh, working in my group. And essentially the question is the following. Um, so when you train the DTNN, did you try several neural network optimizer? And if so, did you notice uh, a, a huge uh, variance, a, a large variance between the different performance? Also, we've used Adam Optimizer as uh, is typically done, uh, which includes the momentum information. Right? Um, I think you would probably, uh, in general, right, in such deep architectures, the how you actually optimize uh, the optimization algorithm for the weights uh, and biases is actually crucial. Um, and um, of course, um, what you have to always do when you do the optimization of the, 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 of the architecture, uh, you have to um, use different uh, training sets, right? And you have to investigate how reliable your results are. And if they're very unreliable in, in the different uh, um, tests that you do, then there is a problem. Um, we've not really found it. I mean, that's the point of deep neural networks that the uh, loss landscape is pretty glassy. And so as long as you are in a deep minimum, right, you don't care in which minimum you actually are. But uh, this is problem dependent. But there's a lot of solutions that uh, people have come up with in the uh, uh, in this problem of optimization of deep networks. But of course, I think physics, and from a physics perspective, there's still a lot of interesting questions about um, uh, what the loss landscapes are and uh, um, how do they change for different problems. I think the analysis of the loss landscape, right, of the error landscape itself is actually an interesting question, which probably deserves some more attention, especially uh, from people in physics. Right. Okay, so um, I guess I don't see any more questions. So um, let me thank uh, um, Alex again for uh, the great talk. And uh, uh, so to all of you out there, so just remind you that the next talk is uh, uh, next Tuesday. 
and we're going to have uh, um, Giuseppe Carleo who is going to uh, talk about something slightly different, uh, how you combine machine learning with uh, many body models. Okay, uh, thanks everybody and uh, happy Eastern. Thank you, bye bye.